Okay, welcome to this autumn's machine learning coffee series, which is as earlier it is every second week here in Otaniemi, every second week in Kumpula. And now, uh, those who are locals, you may have heard of the person who is going to give this talk. If you haven't, now it's high time. He is our new assistant professor, Arno Sully. Welcome, Arno. Thank you, Sami. Um, it's really nice to be here. Uh, Porish was nice. Uh, I never attended a seminar before with Porish, so it uh, should be renamed the Porish Seminar or something, I guess. Um, the topic of the talk today uh, is managing localization and mapping. And there's, there's like a title about that, uh, which is the power of Gaussian processes. Because I think the thing that makes this possible is actually Gaussian processes. Um, this talk is sort of a mixture of uh, quite a long track of research projects, um, many of which have been really nice and really fun to do, and that's why I chose to talk about this topic today. Um, so, magnetic localization and mapping, uh, it has to do with localization, uh, finding the location of something or someone, and uh, creating a map for actually doing that. Um, and then later on in the talk, uh, I'm going to go into how to do the map building part and the localization part at the same time. It's called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Um, I want to tell you that uh, this work, um, like the, the SLAM part of this work, won the best paper award at Fusion, it's a conference uh, on information fusion, earlier this summer. And, uh, Basically, all of these things I'm going to talk about uh, have been joint work with uh, Professor Margaret Koch, uh, who is in Delft nowadays. And uh, the majority of this, these things were done when we both were in Cambridge. That's why the nice examples you see later on are from there. And uh, like I said, it's a long track of projects. And uh, other people involved have been uh, Thomas Schoen from Uppsala, Niklas Wallström, uh, Juho Kannala from Aalto, Simo Särkkä, who is also in Aalto, and Esa Rahtu, who is nowadays in Tampere. Okay, without further ado, let's dive into magnetic fields. So the ambient magnetic field is something that is present in this room at this very moment. So basically, uh, if you think of a compass, it observes the, the magnetic fields, a field that tries to align the compass needle that. But due to uh, metal in buildings, uh, pipes in the floors, or, um, or then there might be some magnetic stuff going on in the bedrock uh, underneath our feet, or then there might be electric cabling or something, uh, creating disturbances to the local magnetic field you observe. And uh, in this picture here, uh, it's a photograph from the Tuas building, which is a bit that way, as you, most of you probably know. And the, the color patches that you see uh, aligned on top of the image are actually uh, a recreation of the local magnetic field in that space. So you see that it's actually not sort of uniform and flat, as you might uh, expect, uh, like you think of the earth magnetic field. But they are like local anomalies uh, creating these, these bumps and patches here. This is actually like the magnitude of the field which is visualized. And the motivation, sort of, what is interesting is that if you have a map of, of these anomalies, you could use those for actually doing localization, like finding your position on the map. That's sort of the background here. Um, so, further on, uh, we can like, motivate the thing by the fact that these bad guys, that I guess most of you carry in your pockets, uh, this is an iPhone, uh, Android phones, uh, even other, other phones uh, have magnetometers in them. And that's the sensor you use for, for aligning your, uh, your map view or when you do uh, drive with your car and try to try to find your uh, route, then you turn the map uh, according to your orientation, your direction. 
So that manometer is used there. And as you might know, um, the phone manometer doesn't always align the phone with your actual orientation. And those things are used to be anomalies. So the phone manometer measures the, the local magnetic field. So that's sort of not the ideal bird magnetic field, but the local disturbed motion of it. And uh, as I said, there is metal uh, pipes, cabling, uh, reinforced concrete, which cause uh, anomalies to these measurements. And uh, these disturbances can be used as features. And the very nice thing here is that there's no need to install the magnetic field. It's, it's here, whether we want it or not. So we can just use the information. There's no need to bring in magnets to create one. Good. Um, so, as you might remember from uh, your high school education or your studies uh, in university, uh, magnetic fields are vector fields. That means that they have a magnitude and a direction. You might remember those small arrows that you, you see somewhere uh, drawn on top of the pictures. Um, so let's call the magnetic field H and it varies by location. So X here is some position in 3D space and uh, given some position in 3D space, we have a value for the magnetic field, which is vector value. Okay, um, now we come to the, the Gaussian process part. So Gaussian processes are very nice and powerful model building tools. Uh, it's basically a machine learning paradigm for modeling uh, unknown quantities and imposing prior knowledge on some unknown functions. So uh, yeah, what does this tell you? Tell you? So the H from the previous slide, the magnetic field, we have some measurement, hi, at some known location, xi. And now we formulate a model where we actually think of this hi being the gradient of an unknown potential function. Why is this? Well, if you go back to high school, the teacher might have told you there that, that if you are far away from any, any sources, say electric cabling creating the, the, the field, um, then you can see a vector field being generated by a scalar potential function. This comes also from the fact that if the, the, the field is curl free, then it can be formulated as a model where the field is generated by a scalar potential. And that basically means that we have some scalar value function phi evaluated now at the same x um, and we take just the, the gradient of it uh, in this case. and that will give us the, the magnetic field we observe. Then we have some noise, just Gaussian noise and this basically is a, a Gaussian likelihood term. The, more interesting part here is the scalar potential function, which we model as a Gaussian process, where we put a GP prior on this unknown function, which we can observe or see, this phi, where we think of the function being a combination of a linear component, which actually is sort of the uh, ideal contribution of the earth magnetic field, and then we have some smooth local anomalies. Those are those bumps you saw in the figure, like those, those which sort of have a length scale like this, like some, some meters. And we think these are like smooth anomalies, which are then created by the magnetic material or some, some disturbing things in the, in the structure around us. So this is the, this is the uh, model for the map of the magnetic field. This uh, research was uh, earlier this year published in IEEE Transaction Robotics and uh, it actually has many quite nice features to it. 
So here's an example of, of where it actually uh, is used in practice. So consider that we have a trajectory uh, going from A to B, from B to C, C to D, and then we have a trajectory from D to E where we don't know the, the values of the magnetic field. So, uh, of course, we could model each of these vector field components separately uh, by similar GP modeling. Uh, this has been done before. And that would give us something, can you see the pointer? Something like this. But then, of course, if we couple the three uh, field components by the scalar potential, then it shares information across the channels. And, well, it's no surprise in that case that actually uh, putting in this, this scalar potential assumption that gives us better predictions uh, in, the, in the range of D to E. So, given a set of measurements at different spatial locations, uh, we can use this modeling for, for uh, extrapolating or interpolating uh, values on the map. And the nice thing is here that we also get some uncertainty estimates. We can quantify our uncertainty of these predictions at those points using the Gaussian process methodology uh, behind. So, uh, usually in Gaussian processes, uh, you do like batch learning, you have all your observations, you put those into your model, and then you, you uh, crank the lever, the, the, the the base button, and then you get out some predictions. But in this case, uh, because we want to do, do uh, things in real time and online in the end, we actually apply a sequential way of thinking of Gaussian processes. So we have a model where we add data as they come in, and we predict after every uh, additional data point. There are some nice methods for this. Here's an example. So here you can see the, the robot moving around and creating the map of the, the magnetic field on the fly. You see the magnitude here, of course, a vector value map, but sort of it's hard to visualize the vector field. And the transparency tells something about the, the uncertainty at the diff like different points. Okay, so now we have a way of modeling the, the, ma like the map creating a map of the magnetic field. So then, to actually do positioning on this map, we need something more. We need a model for the movement. So like we have to constrain the movement somehow. We can teleport around the map, but the movement has to be some sort of continuous movement, like, uh, like previous points have to be close to the previous uh, distance. Uh, and then actually, like positioning is sort of standard, because there's a lot of methodology for doing uh, terrain navigation, like fighter jets use these techniques and so on. So now we can combine sort of a uh, range of existing methodology to actually then try out to, to do positioning on the map. So let's consider a magnetic map of this building. This is like the first floor of the building, and uh, I walked around. Um, some 860 meters of, of walking around the building, and uh, I have some 42,000 measurements of the magnetic field. And then uh, two weeks later, I came back and did some more more walking for creating test parts. And uh, I run like a particle filter where I try to match the the new observations of the magnetic field to the previous map, and that's how create the the parts. Uh, I'm moving along. Okay, so these are the vector valued maps of the magnetic field. And now let's see if, if this runs. So, first, the magnetic field is just very informative when I walk around, but then the trajectory of the measurements become more and more unique. And then finally, the magnetic measurements only match that one route I take through the map. And here, I guess we are now here in this part. So I walk around the, the lobby here. And once it has converged, it follows the the uh, the map really nicely. So here again, 
First it fits a bit everywhere, and then when I continue walking, the trajectory becomes more and more unique and only fits that one path in the map. Okay, how about building a map by the Gaussian processes and doing this localization at the same time? This is actually quite challenging, and that's something that we looked into with Manon uh, this spring. So, why is it harder than just like creating the map first and then doing positioning? Well, basically, because if you don't have the ground truth locations for your observations well, while mapping, it's hard to construct a map because you don't know where you've been when you're observed in this field. So, in theory, uh, it's possible, but it's quite complicated. Uh, the second challenge is that uh, the Gaussian processes, uh, the number of measurements easily becomes so large that the basic GP approaches fail uh, computationally to actually be feasible. And the third problem is that how do you do scale or inference in this case? Uh, what sort of particle filter is capable of actually like solving the problem without requiring like billions and billions of particles? And we looked into these challenges and we came up with a quite neat solution for, for each. Uh, so basically, we have a particle filter where each particle stores an, an entire map of the, of the uh, map history of itself. Um, well, the computational scaling issues are then sort of overwhelming, but we can split the, the maps into the blocks, which are uh, independent per se. And then in those blocks, we can then use, use a basis function expansion uh, given by the GP prior uh, in, in that block. This gives us sort of a very nice sort of uh, basis functions per uh, volume uh, scaling. Uh, the representative power is pretty good. And then finally, uh, because the Gaussian process part is, is well, it's Gaussian, um, and in the particle filter you can construct this model so that the, the uh, map updates are actually conditionally linear, uh, which actually enables you to use the literature of, of RAM localization in the sequential Monte Carlo. There are a lot of my details here. I recommend you, you look to, in the paper for this. But in the end, this gives us linear time complexity with respect to the number of observations we get, and linear scaling in memory uh, with respect to the map size, or the number of blocks we have to use. And uh, to give you an example, this is the, the uh, student IT lab at Cambridge, where we walked around. And the camera image is only for, for your reference in this case, to show you where I'm going. And these are the blocks, and you see the magnetic map of the highest weight particle at each point. So first it's really uncertain, but then when we go back where we started, it can start using the existing map of the magnetic field for correcting the, the drift in the, in the PDR, pedestrian dead record. And now, because it gets on the track and can use the previous observations of the field, to match the new one, uh, it actually stays on track really neatly. So without the magnetic field mapping part, this trajectory would be drifting like further and further away from, from its actual, actual path. But now, when it creates the map and can update that map in the background all the time when it moves, it actually like gets better and better knowledge of where it should be. And I admit, the video is pretty boring, it's just walking around in circles, uh, but that actually shows that the, the method is working pretty neatly in this case. Let's give them a moment of silence to, to finish. And then the map is actually in 3D. And the opposite here tells about the, the uncertainty. So we are pretty uncertain about the magnetic field in those parts where we haven't been, which is 
totally reasonable. And it also works fully in 3D, apart from the, the example that uh, I showed for, for this building, which was like just a 2D plane. So this, this land method is fully 3D dimensional. So here I walked up some stairs and back, and it sort of snaps to the previous part because it starts seeing that the magnetic field map actually matches, matches the new observations it gets. We also made some experiments in the nice old colleges, and uh, it was a bit sad, but apparently in the uh, 1300s or so, when they built the college, they didn't use that much metal in the constructions, and actually for the magnetic mapping to work, you need to have something making the magnetic field informative. There needs to be some sort of anomalies that you can snap to. So in this case, uh, the SLAM approach basically only said that, well, the magnetic field is flat, there's no information, it's hard to tell anything, and the only part of the, the college where we got it to work sort of good was this, this courtyard. We, we walked for some three kilometers around the, the college, but this, this part is the only one with sort of uh, informative magnetic fields. I guess there's some pipes. So, it works better in modern buildings. So, some recap, uh, I talked about mapping, creating maps of the magnetic field using Gaussian processes. Uh, I gave an example of using that map for localizing your device in that uh, magnetic field map. And finally, uh, I briefly showed that it actually can be combined so that you can do the localization and the mapping at the same time in a scalable and actually quite neat way. Um, the details, which I skipped, are all in these papers. So the first paper uh, considers the, the M in SLAM, the mapping part. The second paper tells something about the localization part. And the last one is the, the new paper doing the full pipeline of SLAM. Uh, preprints are available on my homepage and uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter if you need to those things. Thank you very much. There's a question in the back row. Um, so how much metal would you need if you would like to get some like non-metal place work also? Like would it be cost effective to like, add small pieces of metal there? The, the question was that how much metal would I have to use in order to to make the uh, environment informative enough for us? That's actually quite a good question. Uh, I would probably go for installing some pipes in the ground or or something like this. So just bringing in minor stuff like uh, like metal chairs or something would what probably the, not be enough. What is the length scale you need? It? The, the, the character's length scale is a hyperbolic model, and that's lower as well, and it's in the range of one to two meters. Yeah. Usually. I mean, how, how near uh, does the metal have to be? So it, it's like some me meter level. Uh, yeah. So if, if you if you are like five meters away, then <clears throat> not a chance. Then if you're like one to two meters away, then it's pretty good. But it depends on what the metal is, and uh, some power lines might actually be quite, quite good. So is this thing applied in practice already? So uh, magnetic localization as such is actually uh, used quite a lot in different uh, regimes. I guess in, in robotics that's, that's one thing uh, where they use, use it, especially like those uh, lawn movers, they, they basically often just check that they are inside their perimeter by, by seeing some metal on the ground. They don't do localization in distance. But then there's actually a, a startup company uh, called Interatlas, which I'm uh, also associated with, uh, which has this as part of their, their system. They use the magnetic measurements for, for interaction. Of course, it's still like used in combination with other things, but it's part of the system.
So I hope that's the full of practice. You have to go and map the base or the part of the service. If you would be sending this, somebody would have to walk around to, to where the actual measurements were mapping, and then you would put your step for any, anybody who walk. So the, yeah, I can repeat the question. So uh, the question was that would someone need to map the, the area? And for example, in the case of, of uh, Inner Atlas, uh, they have an app where you use, uh, like, you download the app and then you can wrap your your menu and then you can enable your positioning based on the mapping features. Question? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, actually two questions in one. Uh, would it uh, often happen that the local magnetic field changes, uh, for example, if so you switch on uh, or off some uh, huge electric uh, fields or uh, base current is going on or off, uh, green lights on and so on, and if the environment changes, what happens with the products? Well, two questions. The first question was that how stable is the magnetic field? How often does it change? Uh, the second question was that how does that affect the, the model? So actually, this is a question I get quite often when talking about these things. Uh, so basically, on building level, the changes are usually pretty small. It requires so much construction work for, for changes to actually be visible on this scale. So uh, for example, you need to install a new elevator or, or a display or something like that. But then of course, like uh, in uh, university buildings like this, there might be some huge acquired equipment, like typically a physics labs or something, where they actually have some very power hungry things. So that's of course that can cause some, some major uh, fluctuations in the situation. Uh, but in a typical office building or, or apartment building, uh, the changes are actually quite small. Uh, and then uh, second part of the question, uh, how does that affect the thing? Of course, then your map in that part of, of the, the uh, building would not be valid anymore. Uh, but then of course, uh, for example, in the case of, of the slam approach here, you could include that sort of in, the, in your model that you allow the, the map to, to change over time. So sort of all your observations decay away and your observations then sort of replace those. So I, I wouldn't see it as an actual problem. You just need to account for it. Uh, more questions? Well, this question is done with the consumer electronics software measurement device because consumer electronic devices have variables on the magnetic So, how is this measurement process done and people try to be a number of different devices? So, the question was uh, with what sort of equipment the, the magnetic measurements were done? Was the consumer level device or something more fancier? Uh, the majority of the, the experiments were actually done with the iPhone. Uh, the last video was actually done with this phone. Uh, this is an older uh, iPhone 6S, which has quite an okay magnetometer, but then it's nothing compared to uh, really high, high degree of magnetometers. Then in the robot example, which is where you saw the robot driving around, it actually had three different uh, magnetometers attached to it for actually if you wanted to compare if it makes any difference if you have like better sensors or not. We had two smartphones and then we had like a, a high degree uh, expensive nice fancy sensor uh, and link jumping. Uh, and actually the only difference we observed was that the, the fancier sensor had a smaller noise, noise scale but apart from that, it didn't really affect our, our experiments. Like we, we, are, we are only interested in the sort of the big scale sort of the sort of uh, anomalies that you can observe even you with know, it's, it's sort of a very cheap sensor. I guess these sensors in these devices cost twenty cents or something like that. But a good question. More questions? Just one quick question. Uh, is, is this like one stuff that you're building uh, far enough that you could use it for a research project? For example, going for GIS uh, stuff, basically collecting indoor location information from uh, users about how they experience stuff and so on. Because that's something that hasn't 
anybody, nobody has really been able to do because being able to do indoor positioning is kind of difficult. So the question was that uh, is this like research, ongoing research, and could it be applied for GIS stuff? Or? Yes, the, and you know, doing soft side of that, so basically collecting people's experiences that are location side. People do that in outdoor spaces, but you can't really do that in indoor spaces today because of the positioning problem. Yes, yeah, so uh, the question was more like, could this be applied for actual like soft analysis of people's behavior indoors? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, basically, there are a lot of like practical issues for actually making it available so that uh, this could be used like by anyone and in the background or so. Uh, but in theory, this could enable of the trajectory towards that definitely. Uh, indoor position is position is challenging, uh, especially if it needs to be uh, infrastructure free and uh, also uh, if it need to be like preparation free you wouldn't know about the place where the people are are, are or you could like map the place before so so there are like a lot of challenges in this instance but yes in theory, theory like the that's sort of the long term sort of far away goal that these things help with that uh, can you say something about this head recording model? Uh, is it like a like a flight model that uh, if you're yeah. here, then probably uh, you're here uh, uh, again, or are you using some other sensor like accelerometer, accelerometer, uh, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So uh, the question was about the head recording model. Uh, in the example in, in this this building, the model was pretty simple. Uh, it, it actually used the accelerometer uh, and the gyroscope, but only for tracking the, the direction of down. Because you need to rotate your magnetometer values to sort of the coordinate frame of the building. Uh, so it used that, but then the actual movement model was uh, really simple. It assumed that you, the certain probability you move forward, and with a certain probability you stay. So it was like, it's like first try. In the SLAM approach, uh, it's quite a bit fancier. Where actually we, we use the PDR. Uh, the AR kit PDR by Apple, it just does like visual inertial odometry, which gives us uh, like right away uh, an estimate of the point orientation and then a trajectory. But the trajectory is actually drifting quite badly along one scale. So you could think of the SLAM approach I showed in the video being a way of correcting for the drift of the visual inertial PDR. <coughs> More questions? So the Gaussian processes seem to be very suitable for this, but how, how crucial are they? So is, is there some alternative way and how much better is this? That's a good question. So the question was uh, whether the Gaussian processes are actually like crucial, crucial for this or could something more uh, maybe simple be used? So uh, there are previous research uh, on doing uh, positioning uh, based on right field mapping. And the, the methods there have uh, typically been uh, using more simple methods, like just linear interpolation of the magnetic field measurements or such. Um, but then it's, it's quite clear that Gaussian processes are very well suitable for this, especially uh, just encoding the, the scale of potential assumption actually helps a lot. Yeah, compared uh, also just use independent GPs. And if you skip the GP thing altogether, then actually like you're uh, very sensitive to the noise so actually then how to deal with the noise in sensors and then the uh, non-ideal orientation estimates which you have so it's sort of everything sums up all the uncertainties sum up and then in the end you can really trust your magnetic values as well so then like if you can deal with some of the uncertainty in a more structural way it really helps a lot so I would say that, uh, especially like the scale of potential thing, uh, is the enable for enabler for actually doing the, the, the slam. Uh, previous slam approaches for magnetic fields have used some like uh, sparse maps. So you notice when you make a turn, for example, 
and then you extract the feed, like the feature of what that turn looks like uh, in the magnetometer, and then you use that in the slam approach. But this is actually a dense slam, so for every measurement you can like update your both your map and your position against the map. So this is sort of more more robust also to sort of uh, ad hoc extractions. Or something. So inspired by the, the previous question, you you, you showed was it slide seven or something uh, independent GPs then that would have to share information. It, it looked like the, the mean was pretty much the same. Did, did that change or was it just the uncertainty that, that was? I don't go back. Or, so it was you know, this this. Yes, so actually the, the uh, there, there might be differences, but it's yeah, hard to tell from here. Yeah, actually quite quite a big difference. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. 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 I, I think, well, this, this is more of like an example figure. Uh, there are tables in the, in the paper showing yeah. there's okay. a huge yeah. difference in, in the end. Um, but yeah, so both the uncertainty drops, but also yeah. the, the, the mean changes. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? So maybe that's it. So next week uh, in Kumpula, we will have a session by Marcus Heyman speaking. And let's leave that part of us here.